Hi, welcome to Inside 1331. We're at 1331 Cherokee, which is Denver Police Department headquarters. And this is a new show where we're going to ask tough questions, questions that you might not hear the answers to anywhere else. We're going to take experts from within the police department and ask them really difficult questions about pressing issues that other people have been asking. And today, we're lucky enough to have with us Commander Megan Dodge, who's in charge of the... Operations Support Division. Operational Support. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you're here to talk about with me today is body cameras. It's been a hot topic. Um, anybody who's been paying any attention knows that this has actually been an international story. And mm -hmm. Chief White was on the news in China, in Japan, in Switzerland, uh, as well as a, n a lot of local and uh, national TV shows. So you're fully aware of all that. You, mm -hmm. as I like to say, now have the most famous eye in law enforcement in America. Okay, you ready for the tough questions? Sure. Should body cameras be turned on all the time? No. Okay, why? No. Uh, there are multiple reasons. First is the fact that not every contact with the public should be uh, recorded. I think that we have done a good job with developing a trust with our community. Um, sometimes cameras can have the negative effect of that. Can you give me an example? For instance, if somebody were to wave down an officer to tell them, hey, there's a trouble house in my neighborhood, um, I'd like you to go take a look at it, and you know, there seems to be suspicious activity, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things that people haven't called in on. Um, they've waved somebody down, they've tried to talk to them about it on an off the record kind of avenue. So those are the, some balancing of privacy versus public good. And you and I actually have talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, I had a really interesting conversation with you and our internal affairs commander. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, uh, I think you know this, I used to walk through Civic Center Park every single day. And there was a, and I'd talk to a lot of the folks there and they'd come up and talk about their problems and try to get some help and you know, police stuff. And I remember this gal and she was probably in her early 20s and it took about six to eight months before she um, trusted me enough but she pulled me aside one day into the park and she proceeded to tell me a story about how uh, her kids had been taken away from her by social services and some of the struggles she was having and uh, how hard it was for her to get an ID and she needed some drug and alcohol treatment. And after talking to you, it really occurred to me, I don't know that she would have ever had that conversation with me mm -hmm. on camera um, and I would have not had the opportunity to help somebody. Mm -hmm. We have a large variety of contacts with people that Absolutely. the public never realizes we have. Right. They only envision a traffic stop or mm -hmm. a, a call. An enforcement action of types. So, uh, you know, within our policy, we've also given some leeway to officers. For instance, if a, a victim of a sex assault wishes to not be recorded at that time, we're going to abide by those wishes if, if it's feasible, if it's safe for everybody involved. We would never want technology to inhibit <coughs> the ability for us to do the right thing by the public. What would you say to people who say, well, that's just your excuse to get away with bad stuff? Well, currently we don't have anything on and we have a very good uh, department with our officers. So the fact of having the video only um, adds a layer of comfort to some individuals as well as legitimacy to others. And I think that's interesting. I mean, one of the points that I came up with, and this is kind of a statement, not really a question, but is that this is the greatest advancement in transparency in mm -hmm. my 25 years in law enforcement. And yet there just seems to be this, I think, small group of people who mm -hmm. absolutely now are attacking our use of body cameras um, because, that, because it just seems like they either don't like us or don't trust us. Right, well, and in addition to that, to the things we've just talked about, the amount of uh, cost for storage of all that data that really has little to no use, um, as well as um, the privacy concerns. We're trying to weigh privacy. And when you say no use, so you and I talked about this. Driving. What's the point of me yeah, recording me driving around or me having lunch? Yeah, um, or writing a report. Um, uh, there's, there's many times, I mean, and our officers deserve uh, a level of privacy as well. I mean, I would think that no one would argue the fact that officers should be recorded using the restroom or making a private phone call on their lunch break. Those are, those are times when um, our officers still should, we trust our officers. This is just one more level of 
having the public trust as well. I think you bring up a good point, and officers are humans too, mm -hmm. and they have uh, you know wives and girlfriends and husbands and kids and and uh, doctors. I talked to my doctor today. If you can't tell, I have a cold. I shouldn't have to record that conversation for anybody to come review. Exactly. Um, so let me ask you this. So what is the policy as it stands today? Mm -hmm. When does an officer have to record? Well, our policy, it's all encompassing. Uh, the majority of citizen contacts, the officer will record. And when With you rare say that, mm -hmm. what about the, the, the situation in the park? Right. With rare exception, for instance, if, uh, again, there is that discretion, if an officer believes that having the camera on will actually inhibit them from doing their job. They are, they are given the option to turn it so off after they've made an announcement ah, okay. on the camera to say, uh, I'm now turning off my, my camera. I mean, and it's why? It, and why. So there's, so a, there's a recording. Absolutely. Okay, great. Yes. Um, people say that it's not effective to allow officers discretion. Mm -hmm. You think it, it's... We have a lot of discretion in law enforcement in general. So again, we do trust our officers. So this is just one more layer to gain further trust from our community with what our officers are doing. Okay. How about uh, accountability? What's in place? Um, let's just say that I am a rogue officer and I, and I wanna do something inappropriate and I turn off my camera. Mm -hmm. um, what is the department put into place to deal with a situation like that? We are uh, beginning spot checking of data usage. So for instance, if an officer is, um, if the norm is this and the off we find officers who are down here, we're going to go and make sure that they understand the policy, make sure that there aren't just various reasons as to why they wouldn't have had it on if they, if they did a shift in the hospital, that's not gonna be on. Um, there are some areas where there would be explanations for that. Uh, if it comes up in an internal affairs uh, case as well, then those are items where we take a look and see is this a pattern of behavior or is it a failure to understand the equipment? Is it a failure to understand the policy? We are given a really a, a great opportunity with this six month pilot to kind of iron out some of the things that officers are seeing in the field with their equipment as well as the policy. Let me ask you the hard question. That's what this show's about. Mm -hmm. What about somebody who is playing games? What about somebody who is doing the wrong thing and they're trying to avoid being detected on camera? Under that scenario that you're giving me, the small piece is whether or not they have their camera on. Because if you have an officer doing that, the camera is the least of our worries. It's the actions that are happening, which is why they don't want them to be recorded. And as you told me in another conversation, we have mechanisms in place to deal with that Absolutely. and we would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there any oversight outside the police department? Yeah. Um, during the complaint intake, uh, the video, anytime that there is a complaint where there is video, on officer video, that's included with the case file. So the Office of the Independent Monitor will have access to all that video in order to view the actions of the officer, whether it falls within, without a policy, and as well as does it give merit to the complaint or refute the complaint. And I think another thing people forget is that um, internal affairs cases, once they're complete, are available to the public. Yes. So that video would also be available. Could very well be. As, as evidence of the case, depending on some other things which yeah, we're going to get into. Yeah, exactly. But in general, you would say, yeah. if it's purely misconduct. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another issue that comes up a lot is how long video is held. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is how long do we store that data? Right. And um, in my reading, I see that there's usually different levels depending on what the video is for. So if I am running after a bank robber and it becomes evidence in a case, that gets held for a different amount of time Correct. than if I'm just driving around and I accidentally hit the button. Correct. What's our policy? So anything that's not associated with a case. A it, criminal case. A criminal case is, uh, and an internal affairs case because those would be maintained within internal affairs. Those Kay. do not go away either. Um, everything that's in, involved with the case is held based upon the retention uh, laws that that particular retention schedule. Like any other evidence. Absolutely, okay. like any other evidence. Anything that is not, so just a conversation with somebody that I'm not sure is gonna turn out well, that something seems hinky and I turn it on, uh, those would be held 365 days. If it's not in, in line with um, with having a, a case, then they're 
they're deleted at that and point. And that's a long time. It There's is an very agency long time. in Colorado that does seven days. Yes. And it seemed like the average was between 30 and 60. Right. So. We understand that um, complaints can come forth at a later time. So we wanted to make sure that we maintained that for any internal affairs cases, as well as sometimes you have um, things that you're not readily sure of what you have on scene, and then they come in later, and it was in fact a, uh, a case, so. But that's really a big commitment on this department's part, Absolutely. wouldn't you say? What is the cost? Of, I mean, people don't realize, they think, oh, you can go get a $60 camera right. at Amazon. Why doesn't that, why doesn't the department do that? Why is mm -hmm. this so expensive? Right, so the, this technology is different, for instance. It's, it's a technology that is specifically made for law enforcement. So yes, you could very quickly go get a uh, camera pin and put it in your uniform and record things. However, uh, a couple of things that make that where it's not viable in law enforcement. Number one, that video can be altered. So there would be, um, yes, there are forensics that can be done to prove that it wasn't. However, if we had to do that on every, every case, that, could, that cost alone could be astronomical as well. In addition, what we have, every, all of that video is watermarked. So it's watermarked. Ours is? Yes, it's watermarked and recorded, so admissible into court. So that's, that's the difference between the two of those, as well as if you had a personal recording device, there's some manipulation that has to take place in order to get that off the device. So in order to limit the overtime costs and make Which it- Which is very expensive. It is very expensive. You don't want to pay 700 officers for an hour every day to download video. Yes. Okay. So the program is 1.5 million for the first year in 2015. That cost includes 800 cameras as well as storage. And what does the camera cost? Uh, roughly a thousand dollars and it depends on the manufacturer etc. So is the storage by camera or is it just as a whole? We buy a it's, certain amount of it's storage. It's a certain amount of storage. Okay for the geeks out there. Yes uh, I don't is know. This in a, is this in a, no is this oh. in a uh, server? Do uh, we keep it? The cost of having a server is is pretty expensive. So the way that this technology works is a cloud-based server. So somebody else has got our data. S somebody else has well they're holding our data for us. Okay. They do not have access to our data. Okay. So they are the ones who are managing the server, et cetera. Okay, so I want to touch on something. You just said access to our data. That's another thing that comes up quite a bit. Who can access this video? Can the officer delete it? No. Can the officer edit it? Mm -hmm. No. Um, can no. I go get it? No. So who can get it? Who can watch it? How does that work? So currently under the pilot, what we have limited it to is the detectives who obviously need it for their cases. They have access, internal affairs has access, um, the CRO office, conduct review office has access to it. Obviously for people who don't know what that is, conduct review is the people who make a determination about guilt or innocence on, on a complaint. Correct. Okay. So um, they have that as well as my office of the civilians as well as a few of our detectives who have access to help with that. And that's read-only access. That's correct. Who can delete it? Uh, Chief of Police. Okay, so it's pretty limited. It is limited. Can anyone edit it? No. There's, it's impossible. There's no way. And that was going back to what we were talking about before. Um, what makes this different than, say, a, a camera pen is the fact that there is no manipulation. You dock the, um, the camera as well as the battery piece. As soon as it's docked, the uh, docking station grabs all the data that the officer has taken during their their uh, shift and it uploads it into the cloud. Kay. So there's no, there's nothing that is done at that point. So that should alleviate some people's concerns about us trying to edit out some Absolutely. thing that we mm -hmm. don't care for. There's just no Correct. ability to do that. No. You also told me that there's an audit trail. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so for every recording that hits the cloud, what is available to us within the software that the manufacturer has is the ability to see who has accessed, how many times they have access, meaning watched, uh, have they shared it with anyone, where did it go to, um, how many times did they do that, all of those things. Anytime you click on it, there is an audit trail that shows who accessed it, how they accessed it, where they accessed it, all of those things. Have you, in the pilot program, watched that? Have you seen that happen? That's oh, what absolutely. It works, and you've mm -hmm. seen the audit trails? And yes, yes. This isn't like IRS emails that disappear? No. Okay. It is definitely All right. Not. Should anyone in the public be able to come in at any time and say, I want to watch this video. I know that the cops were at my neighbor's house yesterday. 
I've had a fight with them for long years. I even have a, a lawsuit in, mm -hmm. in small claims court, and I want to see that video. I think it supports what we've been saying for a long time. So we recognize that people knowing that there's video there is going to want to look at it. Um, however, as a department, we try to balance between transparency and privacy. So there are considerations that go into effect that make it where showing video to the general public is, is ill-advisable um, without it being vetted first. So a lot of people, that when they first hear your answer, they think, oh, this is just a great way to hide. Mm -hmm. This is the cops trying to hide mm -hmm. bad behavior. Right. Can you give me an example of why we wouldn't want to show mm -hmm. video Can that, may, that may appear, by the way, to anybody other than a few people uh, totally benign and, and right there's a multitude of things that we specifically looked at juveniles for instance and the um, law is very specific yes. about what you can do with juveniles. yes so juveniles can't be released through us so that's something we have to be concerned about sex assault victims is another thing that we need to be concerned about commonly called the rape shield law absolutely um, the fact that we in law enforcement go into people's private homes and so when we're in somebody's private home and we're recording the interaction, it may be mundane to everyone else. However, that's your private place. You've called officers there. That, that should be held secure. There's, there's pieces of that. I think the example I gave you yesterday is a domestic violence um, victim or a stalking incident where um, somebody could falsely call officers in, we go check out, make sure everything's good, now and then, and then that person would be able to go so see So we've inside. really become a party to a stalking situation. Absolutely. All so right, those so are let things. me throw another one mm -hmm. at you. Um, I'm stopped on the highway, and I don't think the officer did the right thing, and I want to see the video. Mm -hmm. Or I want to see the video to see if it really showed me going through a red light. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, the way that we currently do any type of uh, weighing is through Harris versus the Denver Post. Which is a case in it's the... It's a case law. Mm -hmm. It's a case law about open records in Colorado. Absolutely. Okay. And so uh, we have a attorney that takes a look at each of those requests for um, records that we have to say whether or not um, it should or shouldn't be released and why it should or shouldn't be released. So it might get released. Absolutely. That's yeah. what you're saying. It there's could. no there's no blanket that no this will not be released. Right. Okay, but mm -hmm. but there are some we won't, right? We have Somebody's house. Correct. Children. We, we've used this very very similarly with our Halo program. Okay, which you run. Right. Could you just tell people what that is? Yeah. So it's the big bulbs that you see all over mounted on the city. What they are are cameras that allow us to make sure that we help with the prevention and prosecution of crime. We use that uh, video surveillance to um, make it into evidence for various crimes that detectives need and provide safety to the citizens. But the difference between the halo and the body cameras is halo is not privy to private residences. Or sound. And sound. Right. So there is a difference between the two of these technologies. I think another thing you hit on that, that's really important to emphasize is that the police get called when something's wrong, usually mm -hmm. the worst day of your life. Right. And should that always be available to everyone to see. Right. And, and really, we do that right now even with Halo Camera at uh, Civic Center Park, right? We wouldn't necessarily just release that video unless Correct. there was a strong public need. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And what would you say to people who say, well, why do you get to determine the strong public need? I don't. It, it would be the attorney who takes based a look at it law. based upon the law. Yes. Okay. So there really is no blanket. There's just some, no. some hard rules on the legal areas. Right. Okay. There are some people who are concerned about... Um, um, the software, facial identification, facial recognition. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the pilot program for body cameras or anything? No, not, not even something that um, is part of the software that I mean, this People have talked to us about it, but it's certainly not yeah, something no. we're doing. Mm -mm. Okay, so they don't have to worry about facial recognition software at this no. point. Do we have a policy in Denver that says officers have to tell someone they're being recorded? No, we don't. We are not a two-party state. Right, we're a single consent state, Correct. which is the law you're talking about. Right. Which means, uh, for the viewers, that that in Colorado you can record someone else without their permission as long as one person in the recording no, knows it. they're being recorded. Correct. But should we? Should we tell people? What's your thought about that? Where are we at with that? Why do we do what we do? Right. So obviously we're not covertly uh, recording anyone. Because there's a visible it's, camera. It's either on your collar or on glasses. So there's nothing covert about that. People know that there's a camera on this officer. Uh, mm -hmm. There has been times that other agencies have seen and 
we have stressed this in the training that if you believe that it will help um, diffuse a situation, let the person know you're being recorded. So there's nothing that says an officer can't do that? Absolutely not. We mm -hmm. just don't require it. Right, and there also could be times when telling somebody that it's actively being recorded could actually incite it. So we give that piece of judgment up to the officer to know the tone and the totality of the of the call that they're on. So that I guess another way to say that is we want them to have the discretion to manage that situation based on their training and experience. Right, not the technology managing and not the situation. not force the camera to change the dynamic. Correct. Okay. Um, officer performance is another big issue when it mm -hmm. comes to body cameras and one of the questions and this is a lot of times um, the officers themselves that are asking these questions mm -hmm. sh do we have random checks uh, to see how an officer is treating people no no we, we, we don't we don't have that at the, obviously during the pilot we don't have that what we do have in place is for instance if an officer comes up on a PAS review um, these which is an early warning it's an system early warning system correct to try to to try to identify behavior from an officer before it gets to the point Correct. where we're reading about it in the newspaper. Right, so if an officer comes up with a PAS review, then that gives the sergeant, lieutenant, commander the ability to take a look and do spot checks on the work and that the, the officer And the intention is to what? The intention is to make sure that we catch any concerning behavior prior to it becoming- Address it. We're coming an issue, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I get a contract with a bar outside of my normal shift, mm -hmm. we call that off-duty. That's yep. the term we use. And I'm paid by the bar to basically be present and enforce Denver's laws while I'm at the bar. Right. Is that a fair representation? Yes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those situations, the reason the officers get paid is because it's a more volatile spot, mm -hmm. a be, nightclub yep. or you know a lot of alcohol, right. things like that. So there are a lot of incidents off-duty. Um, what are we doing about body cameras off-duty? So right now during the pilot, uh, we are not using them for off-duty. Obviously, this is not a technology that's department-wide. So to give um, some employers the benefit without others, we felt was probably not the way best way to utilize the, uh, the Do taxpayers. Do you see this coming where everybody will have these off-duty? Uh, we don't really know at this point. So something we're gonna look at. Yeah, something that needs to be looked at. Is it and fair addressed. to say that would be really expensive? It would be very expensive. And when and I say very expensive, what are we talking? Well, it depends. If we're holding any of that uh, information for at least 365 days, that can that can add up very quickly. Releasing that space on that server, so um, then the question like becomes: Like hundreds of thousands of dollars, it right? It could. It absolutely, absolutely could. And I'm not saying that to say we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying no, you but, can't just make that decision. But many questions have to be asked as to who incurs that cost and how we how we manage that. And is it worth it? Exactly. Right. It's mm -hmm. a. It's also a cost balance. Absolutely. But it could be. I mean, it's not it something might we have said no to. Yes. Um, you and I also had a discussion. I think a lot of the public doesn't necessarily think about this. Um, you might be driving down the street. Uh, in fact, I know that all police officers I know, at least in Denver, have had this happen. You pull over a car, everything's going great, and next thing you know, the guy runs away. He just takes off, mm -hmm. or he takes off running right at you, or right. some just totally abnormal behavior that now you have to deal with. So that. In those kind of situations, we talk a lot about officer safety. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that goes through your mind as a cop is what? Go take care of it. I got to take care of it. Yes. How does officer safety come into play with the body cameras? Obviously, we have taken a uh, great stride within the policy to make sure that officers can get used to almost on every situation, at least at the beginning, activating that camera. So um, like any new habit that you're trying to learn, it First, it, it becomes more of a conscious thought versus a what we would like to call muscle memory. But is it fair to say that you don't expect officers to put their safety in no, jeopardy absolutely to make not. sure that they're turning this no, on? No, absolutely not. And so some of the training that we have had, for instance, if there was a scenario that you're just driving back to the station, getting ready to end your day, and a fight happens right in front of you, spills out on in, into the street, um, we want you to go take care of that. So it would be idea if you hit the button and went out and handled the situation at hand. However, the benefit of this equipment is if an officer doesn't and just jumps in there to handle what they need to do, because we also, because of the safety of the public, we don't want them fiddling with technology without taking care of right. what it is that they're truly hired to do. Um, so there is a 30 second buffer within this equipment that as soon as you hit the 
the record button, even after the situation's over, if the officer has the uh, wherewithal to, re to remember to hit that button, the 30 seconds prior will be recorded as well, video only. So that's kind of passively recording all the time. Absolutely, after every 31 seconds, it drops off recycles. and starts and recycles, mm. yes. Okay, what if somebody is gonna talk to a victim of crime, any crime, mm -hmm. um, and, and they've got the body camera on, do they have to have consent of the person before they take a video statement? No, they don't, they don't. Obviously, we've asked the officers to use their best discretion of it. In no way would we ever want technology, again, to inhibit our job, which is investigating and preventing crime. So if it We don't want to jeopardize cases. We don't, we don't, for the sake of having video. Okay. Are officers required to document incidents where they did use video? Like, in other mm -hmm. words, maybe I didn't like the video very much and I'm hoping it just flies under the radar. Am I supposed to tell somebody that I did video? Is that documented somewhere? Yeah, every piece of video that an officer records in the field, they need to tag it with the CAD number that is associated with that call or with that incident. Dispatch. Yes. So there's a number that comes So when there's an call incident starts. number for everything an officer does. So every time an officer activates that video, it should be tagged with that incident number, whether or not there was a case, arrest paperwork, any, So the anything. system is designed to document that it was used. Absolutely. And failure to tag it doesn't keep it from being within the system. So even if you, even if an officer were to forget to tag it with the case number, the date, time, and officer badge number is stamped on every single piece of video. All right, so one of the last issues that's brought up a lot, are officers able to make copies of their own videos and then use them for things or mm -hmm. put it on their Facebook page, things like that? No, no, absolutely not. Again, um, it's, it's not the property of the officers, it's the property of the department and citizens in, in so much as an officer can't decide to photocopy it, uh, video it, and then subsequently put it on a Facebook page. So we have that within the policy um, we also have that within, you know, on crime scenes, et cetera. There's no place for any of that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be vetted under the way that we already have in place for citizens to make requests of, of that footage. So you've been kind of married to this project now for at least six months, been yes. taking up a majority of your time. Yep. Uh, and you've been to public meetings. You've heard what people are saying. You've mm -hmm. watched it in action. What's your take on this? What do you think? Are body cameras really a good move forward? Is this is this more positive, more negative? What's your take? So my take on this is that we are still in the infancy, I believe, of this technology. And you mean Denver or the world? World, yeah. This is something, even according to Taser, this is at the innovation stage of technology. They haven't reached market saturation even. So this is very new. There's quite a few things for all law enforcement to learn on policies, procedures, case law, et cetera. Um, the, I believe that it is a positive thing and it's something that's going to have to continue to grow. Being on the forefront of any innovation, we have to be willing to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And that was our purpose and intent behind having a six month pilot that Chief White made sure that we, we did before we rolled out across the city. We wanted to take our lessons learned in a six month pilot within District 6 and learn from that, make changes, find out what works, what doesn't work, and then end up with the best product for Denver. But if you were the chief, would you do this? Is this the right thing to do? I think it is. I think it is a way to add to the um, trust our community, the majority of our community already has, and um, it just adds another layer for officers to do their job and prove that um, what they're doing is the right thing to do, and those that aren't, it gives us an ability to hold them accountable. I want to thank Commander Dodge for coming in and, and uh, being the first person to really sit in that hot seat and answer questions. If you have any questions or areas of the law or what we do that you would really like us to dig in deeper and ask some tough questions of, there's an email address at the bottom of your screen. I would encourage you to email us and let us know what questions you would like us to ask because we want to do this and we think it provides a great service to the people of Denver. So thank you very much.